All right. Well, greetings and welcome, everybody. Welcome to the first meeting of the new year, which this slide seems to be a year in the past, but it's really January 11, 2022. And this is the Amateur Astronomers Association of Princeton. And we have an exciting meeting tonight planned. I have a few announcements I'm going to go through for about 10 minutes. Some interesting things to uh, share with you about what's up in the sky. And then I'll turn it over to Victor, who will introduce our main speaker for the night. And I'm sure that uh, you guys tuned in for that very reason. So we'll take that through about an hour of a presentation. And then we'll take a quick break. And then we're going to come back and discuss some um, astronomy activities within AAAP, activities by members. And you can see in the list there, I'm going to urge all of you to come back after the break. Whether you're a member or not, you're welcome to stay on board through and we'll try to get this meeting wrapped up about 9 30 quarter of 10. We can dream about doing astronomy and of course our club has very strong connections with Princeton University and I'm showing you a picture of Peyton Hall the Department of Astrophysical Sciences back on the campus which we wish we could get back to but right now it's looking like it's not going to happen at all this spring. I'm just kind of cluing you into that fact we want to uh, keep those connections strong and so we're going to imagine Imagine ourselves sitting in the auditorium at Peyton Hall right now talking about astronomy. A lot of good things happened last year and maybe some better things will happen this year. Uh, the club will continue to do its virtual meetings and do its activities out at the observatory, which is one place the members can congregate in the warmer months. We are closed for the winter season, but uh, we still are keeping our efforts in uh, astronomical observing alive by doing the Astro Video Live sessions, what I'm calling the winter sessions, have fired up again. And on Friday nights, once a month, nearest the Friday nearest the new moon, we're holding sessions with telescopes and Astro Video camera live feed going into the Zoom meeting. And we found that usually this works pretty well. Not that we don't have our glitches. I think we have our fair share of those, but we have some very powerful telescopes that we can bring to bear on the night sky and show you pictures of a few. The one on the upper left is the club's observatory main telescope with a ZWO camera set up to do the astro video. The one on the upper right is my personal telescope in my home observatory. In the lower left, our newest member joining the recent meeting January 7th, just last Friday night, uh, Rich Sherman with his home set up a four inch 100 millimeter sky watcher and a ZWO camera. And Rich had some excellent, maybe the best views we had on Friday night were coming from his setup, which happens to be in the Gulf Coast down in Florida. Lucky devil. He uh, missed the, the cold nights that a couple of us, especially Dave Skid and Jen Skid, were out there manning the C-14 and it did get a bit cold, but uh, thanks for that effort, guys. And then on the finally the lower right, Bill Murray, who has a five inch astrophysics refactor set up in a home dome and Bill often joins our session. So the next one will be February 4 and we'll send a Zoom link in advance by email. But I'm emphasizing this because it's an important way for us to keep some continuity going. And it's great to see additional members getting into the fray. We've been all about trying to get members in the club up on the curve and getting their own equipment where they can actually do astro video on their own and join these sessions, porting their telescopes output right into the Zoom feed. So there's room for more. Uh, your scope could be here in the next session. So get in touch with me by email and let me know if you're interested in joining. And it's a, it's a trial by fire type of effort. And uh, we'd love to have more members participating as observers and as senders from their telescope. Another announcement here, uh, you're probably aware of this, but I just want to spread this far and wide that the merchandise shop is now open and you can purchase online securely logo, AAAP logo branded uh, items, mostly apparel at this point in time. This is kind of a beta test stage. We may be adding items as time goes on. So take advantage of it. Get the hot new apparel with the AAAP logo on it. Let your friends and family know that you're an astronomer from Princeton. And this is not limited to uh, members only, uh, is password protected, but we don't mind sharing that password on the website, which you can also get off of the website, the, the AAAP website and Sidereal Times issues. 
So now, turning our thoughts to what's up in the sky, I'm offering you guys a challenge tonight. So maybe you've been following this in news, but something interesting has happened. And we do like to pay attention to moving objects in the sky, not just necessarily the deep sky, but things in our own solar system that change from day to day, indeed, hour to hour. And I'm going to ask you guys to take up the challenge to try to observe the near-Earth Apollo asteroid number 7482, which has the official designation 1994PC1. You can search for that on the web. It will be making its closest to Earth approach on January 18th, coming up in a week here. And if you take this challenge, the goal is to share images or astro video thread of your take on this asteroid on the AAAP server on the Discord app that we've started up, as well as in sidereal time. You could write up a brief blurb and get it in sidereal times for the February issue. Now, this is not an easy challenge. Uh, and part of it is I'm um, asking you to see the movie, Don't Look Up, starring some pretty big actors out of Hollywood, Leonard Leo DiCaprio and uh, Jennifer Lawrence. If you haven't seen it yet, I urge you to see it and you'll get the connection of why this matters in an astronomy context because Don't Look Up talks about a hazardous asteroid that's heading towards Earth and its discovery by a couple of astronomers and what the aftermath had happened. Well, you know, Hollywood predicts the future reality sometimes. If you believe that, well, you might believe this one. There is coming towards Earth a close approaching hazardous asteroid. No, it's not predicted to hit, but this uh, particular one, 7482, 1994 PC1, is coming closer to Earth than anything its size has in quite some time. Some information on here about this. You can see it's really interesting, these so-called Apollo asteroids, their name for the prototype that was first discovered in 1862. But these guys cross Earth's orbit. And unlike the, the vast majority of the asteroids that are out there near the orbit of Jupiter, these guys are coming in inward towards the sun and they cross the orbits of the inward planets. And for that reason, they make collisions. In astronomical time, they make collisions frequently such that their half-life is less, less than 10 million years and they are continually replenished after they're being uh, colliding with, with an inner planet. More of them take their place because of gravitational influences of Jupiter on the large asteroid belt. So this is one of these Apollo asteroids. And, you know, to put that movie in context, thousands of these have been discovered, particularly since NASA and JPL launched this program with the Center for Near Earth Object Studies, where now you can see over time the discovery of now up to 20, oh, it looks like 28,000 total near Earth asteroids have been discovered. And most of them are small, uh, but a very small uh, set of them in the red here are one kilometer and larger. And that indeed is what the current object of interest is. It's about 1.1 kilometers. It was discovered back in 1994. So this is actually precedes the NASA JPL effort by astronomers down in Australia at the famous Siding Springs Observatory. And you can see their calculations published in the Minor Planet Bulletin back in 94. You can see their calculations then projected a very near Earth approach in 2022. And this is the one we're talking about. It's going to come within one one hundredth, 13 one hundredths of an astronomical unit of Earth in one week. And so just to emphasize this a little more, I thought I would try to share with you <clears throat> the ephemerides and the solar system plotting that we can do. If I can get this to work now, bear with me. Um, here I'm taking you to our favorite program, the Sky 10, which allows us to show the trajectory and orbits of the planets and any, anything up in the sky. And what I'm showing here in blue is the orbit of the Earth. I'm going to set this in a motion in just one minute here. The orbit of the Earth, here's Venus, here's, Mar uh, here's Mercury, the Sun, the orbit of Mars in red here. And here is the asteroid in question. And you're going to see it make its approach here. By the way, last month, we were all in a craze about the comet Leonard and it making a good close approach to Earth. And we captured some astro video of that as well. And you all have seen that in sidereal times and elsewhere. A number of members got excellent shots of that. That's this green object here. It'll move through its orbit as well. I'm not plotting the orbit. Here we are 
on around the middle of November, and I'm going to set this to move pretty fast. So keep your eye on the pink ball and the blue ball. And here we go. Now we're on December 8th, 12th, 16th, 18th, 20th, coming up the new year now, coming up. And here we are today. No, sorry, next week. <laughs> Here we are on the 18th of January. So next week when it makes its closest approach and you see what happened here, I'm gonna go back and just repeat that. You can see what happened with the comet that we were all interested in right here in green. And there it makes its closest approach to earth right there. Here comes the asteroid. Oh, that was a close call. How bright will it be? Well, so if it is, that is the question. So this comet is going to be about magnitude 10 at its brightest point. Right now, it's probably not going to be visible, but it's going to brighten rapidly. It'll approach, um, it will approach a magnitude 10 at its closest. Let me come back to my slide here. i got one more slide on this, I think. Um, um, I'm not sure I do. Well, maybe I don't. I thought I had its uh, position in the sky, but you can find, well, yeah, here it is right here. On the 18th of January, it's going to be in Pisces near Cetus, near the planet Uranus in the sky, and it will approach magnitude 10. Now, in order to pick that out from background scars, you're going to have to really take some careful notes. There obviously are a lot of sites online, Sky and Telescope, and otherwise, EarthSky.org has some really good finder charts. I'm going to use the Sky 10, which actually what I was showing you there in the planetary uh, orbit, um, I can take those, uh, the orbital elements of the comet right into the software of the program and I can guide any of us using the Sky 10, including the clubs set up out at the observatory. We can guide on the, uh, on the asteroid using the elements which we can download from the Minor Planet Center. So, we're set up to do that. I'm urging you guys to do it. Everybody who thinks they have the capability, let's see if we can get an image of this near-Earth asteroid that's causing the craze and ironically plays right into the movie from uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. So anyway, that's uh, pretty much what I had in the way of announcements, what's happening. I think we have a lot more to talk about in astronomy, but we're going to save that till after the break. So I'm going to turn this over now to Victor, if you're ready. Uh, I will uh, release my screen, turn it over to you for the, uh, the main event here. Um, it is really my pleasure tonight to introduce our guest speaker, Professor Robert Williams, Astronomer Emeritus at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, the title of his presentation is Observing Galaxy Formation with the Hubble Space Telescope. From his unique perspective as former director of the Space Telescope Science Institute, um, uh, Professor Williams will present a brief history of the Hubble Space Telescope, including its travails and the servicing of the telescope by NASA astronauts who describe the history of how Hubble has obtained clear views of objects in the distant universe and the basic principles by which astronomers have used the Hubble to look back in time to piece together the formation of structure in the universe after the Big Bang. Professor Williams will compare computer simulations and actual Hubble observations, which indicate that small perturbations in the early universe grew to form galaxies that now fill the cosmos. So a brief bio, uh, Robert Williams received his undergraduate degree from UC Berkeley and his PhD in astronomy from the University of Wisconsin. He was senior Fulbright professor at University College London. He received the Alexander von Humboldt Award from the German government and the Karl Schwarzschild Medal for career achievement in astrophysics by the German Astronomische Gesellschaft. Okay, I practiced that. Uh, in addition to his emeritus position at STSCI, Professor Williams is distinguished Overbrook Professor at UC Santa Cruz. Before assuming his present positions, he spent eight years in Chile as director of the Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory. Prior to that, he was professor of astronomy at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Professor Williams is an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Professor Williams is a strong advocate for science education 
and has lectured around the world on astronomical discoveries and the importance of science in modern life. He and his wife, Elaine, a pediatric psychologist, co-founded a nonprofit organization in Baltimore that places adults with autism in the workplace. Professor Williams' research specialties include NOVI, Nebulae, and emission line spectroscopy and analysis. Ah, okay, so I am sharing uh, his slides since he has a not so terrific um, internet connection. So take it away, Professor Williams, and I'll be advancing your slides. Let's go to number one here. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, so let me say that I, it's a real pleasure to be talking to people at Princeton. Princeton, of course, uh, just that name, the University Institute of Advanced Study of made uh, important contributions to astrophysics. And you'll be hearing the names of some people I'm sure you're familiar with, Lyman Spitzer, John McCall, Jim Gunn, and the like um, uh, during my talk. Uh, first thing I want to do is apologize again for the fact that I normally would be giving this lecture in my office at Space Telescope. In fact, Space Telescope, the Institute is off limits to everyone, even a former director, for two weeks because of the commissioning of Webb Space Telescope. Um, and things are, are, are just a popping down there, as you no doubt know from reading in the press. And therefore, for two weeks, only the Mission Operations Center people are allowed on site. Now, not a big deal, except I happen to live in a nice place here in the northern uh, Baltimore County woods uh, with only Verizon digital signal line, which has a, a very narrow bandwidth. And so we actually try, I'm going to show you some movies. We tried it uh, before the meeting started, and there's a good delay uh, in the movies of at least 20 seconds, and so I cannot show them. So Victor's going to do that. Uh, and not only that, I'm going to have to uh, close off my video to make sure that you get my audio. So I'm going to uh, just show you a screenshot of me uh, down at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, actually, with uh, someone that uh, I took down there in her first trip uh, some months ago. Um, so let me now do that and um, get going. And Victor, tell me if there are any uh, problems I need to be aware of in terms of delay or, or bad audio or something. Just tell me I should repeat something, okay? No, we're, we're okay so far. Great. So I was asked to talk about some aspect of the research of Hubble, and uh, there are so many topics that one could talk about, but I decided to focus on something that I had something to do with, although it no longer is my primary research interest, which are Novi, by the way. And since I am talking to amateurs, let me tell you that right now I'm working on a paper with an amateur in Australia who took some spectra of a Nova five years ago that just in the past couple of weeks has been discovered to be a very interesting gamma ray source. And he's the only person who took spectra of this Novi. Um, and, and so here we have uh, uh, really an example of uh, amateur groups who are making observations of transients that are really making a difference in our understanding of astronomical objects. So I, I want to give a shout out to, to amateurs uh, uh, in particular. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about uh, how structure formed, large scale structure formed in the universe and what Hubble telescope has had to do with that in spite of the fact that it was not anticipated to really make the contributions that it has. But before we get to that, uh, let me start by saying something about the Hubble. So Victor, next slide. So um, uh, this is why the telescope's up there. And by the way, um, uh, you guys seem to be serious amateurs. Uh, that's a real credit to you. So I'm going to be telling you a lot of things that you already know, um, but that's all right. One of the famous statements of well-known physicist Max Born was, never underestimate the pleasure with which people hear something they already understand. So. <laughs> Uh, we'll start off with something I think you understand, and that is why is Hubble up there? Here you have uh, two pictures side by side, one on the left taken with the 8-meter telescope, uh, VLT down at Paranal, uh, the 30 Doradus Nebula in the south, and then on the right, Hubble. 
Um, no contest, even though a two and a half meter mirror of Hubble is so much smaller than the eight meter ground-based mirror. Look at the dark background, look at the high spatial resolution. That really is the great value of Hubble Space Telescope. Um, next slide. Um, Hubble was launched in uh, 1990, uh, had been in development uh, for 20 years, and at the time of its launch uh, was the most expensive uh, scientific uh, project in, in history. Uh, at time of launch, um, over $2 billion. And in fact, now 30 years in operation, that sum goes up to 10 billion, putting it on par of the cost of Webb Telescope uh, at its launch. Um, its uh, orbits at a height of around 380 miles uh, with a period of a little over an hour and a half. So half the time it spends on the day side of the earth, other uh, half in the night side of the earth. And uh, it's close enough to the earth, of course, that the earth uh, occults always, always uh, one hemisphere. Uh, so it's always looking uh, outward. Um, takes data um, uh, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. It uh, shuts down some of the instruments, uh, several orbits each day when it goes through what's called the South Atlantic Anomaly, which is a low point in the Van Allen belts that's just off the coast of Brazil. Otherwise, always operating about six or seven times a day. So the data is captured by five instruments that are behind the mirror. And if I had the cursor, I could show you where the mirror is. But on the telescope there, you see that there is a broadening at the right hand of the telescope. The mirror sits right at that edge and all the instruments are on the right hand side. Uh, the reaction wheels, the electronics, uh, the instruments, the gyroscopes, the batteries, uh, everything's there on the right. And so when the astronauts go up to service it, they're almost always dealing in that right hand, the rear end part of the telescope. Uh, data used to be captured on tapes, you know, actual moving tapes. Now, of course, it's all digital. About six or seven times a day, all the data is uploaded to a tracking and data relay satellite, so-called TIDRA satellites that are governed by the military and, and NASA, that are downloaded to uh, White Sands, New Mexico, a ground stationer who microwave it over to Goddard Space Flight Center that's just outside of Washington, D.C., and they sent it up to us here in Baltimore at Space Telescope Science Institute. And by the way, in that picture of the Institute, right in the right-hand side uh, where a tree is in front of it is where the web mission, the entire web operating mission control center is right in that uh, uh, third floor uh, series of, of windows there. So all the information you're getting out in some of the pictures are, are coming out of the right side of uh, the Institute there. The data, of course, is stored in our archive and we immediately send it out to uh, the astronomers of the world. Uh, so telescopes uh, worked just great for 30 years, but it wasn't always that way. Next slide. When it was launched, next slide, Victor. Oh, hold on, something's. I think the issue I was having, I couldn't advance the slide out of full screen. That is peculiar. It was working fine before. <clears throat> hmm. If you leave full screen display, you can advance. Are we gonna have to do that every time? Yeah, that's life, okay. Not, so uh, in any event, let me uh, let me just keep talking. We'll see. We'll try to work our way through all of this. So after one month after launch, uh, uh, everything, all the systems were brought up. Um, the main thing was the telescope tubing had to be outgassed so it wouldn't contaminate the mirror. And so after a month, uh, there was a big first image that was taken of a cluster of stars. And a group of uh, technicians were at Goddard Space Flight Center and astronomers were at our institute looking and analyzing the first image. And there you see it um, uh, on the left there. And there was good news and bad news. Good news was actually we got an image, you know, and uh, the, the system seemed to be working. Bad news was that it wasn't supposed to look like that. The, uh, the technicians thought, hey, looks good. The astronomers at the Institute took a close look 
at the image, you can see that there's a lot of scattering around each one of the stars, and a blow up of one of those stars is over there on the right. And uh, uh, to a non-specialist, it just looks like the telescope might be out of focus. But to uh, uh, astronomers who understood optics, a number of them said, no, that looks like something more serious. It looks like there's an aberration. And to make a long story short, uh, over a period of weeks, there were um, uh, groups mainly associated with the instruments, uh, some of whom were at Princeton. And uh, one of the main ones, well, two of them were Chris Burroughs at the Institute and Sandy Faber, professor of astronomy, who's a close colleague of mine at UC Santa Cruz, who realized, nope, it's a spherical aberration, fundamental aberration caused by the fact that there was a mismatch in the shape of the primary and the secondary mirrors. And it did not have an easy fix. If the telescope had not been in focus, that was simple. Move the secondary and put it back in focus. In fact, because of the misshapen mirror, it was a serious problem that had no easy fix. Um, so uh, at the Institute, we convened a committee, what to do? Um, Got to repair it, right? Uh, expensive uh, project like this had been in development for over 20 years. I can't let this go. So um, proposals were received. You could fit them into two groups. One group said, hey, bring the telescope back down to Earth and, you know, let's go over it and fix it and then send it back up. Another group said, no, servicing missions had always been planned. Let's try to figure out some way in which the astronauts can service this, mainly because uh, show the uh, uh, hit return. It's not the next slide, but I've got some there. Yeah, there we go. That's what the image was supposed to look like and, and didn't. Um, so next slide, uh, when it was revealed that there was a serious flaw of the telescope, of course, the Congress was outraged, the American public who uh, had $2 billion of their tax money spent on it, uh, really came down on astronomy and NASA, and you could not turn on a television show like Johnny Carson or open a newspaper without a political cartoon, it really lambasted us. And uh, this is my favorite cartoon, particularly notice the shuttle on the right. Uh, and that's how things were. Um, we were in a funk and it was for this reason we realized that you couldn't bring the telescope down because the way the public and Congress felt about it is once the telescope was on the ground, it would be declared dead. <laughs> So in fact, the Institute came up with a scheme with NASA to insert corrective optics, um, which is uh, no surprise because all of you must know in a single lens reflex, when you uh, take apart, uh, you know, your zoom lens on, a, on a, um, a, a, a good camera, it consists of about seven or eight different pieces of glass, all of which are lenses themselves that correct the aberrations that enable a lens to bring light to a sharp focus. You know, it corrects for pin cushion distortion, coma, astigmatism, spherical aberration, and the like. And so we realized that if we took an instrument, one of the seven, six instruments out of the telescope, five or six, I can't remember the number at that time, then you could insert the corrective optics and correct for the aberration. And since Servicing missions had always been planned. In fact, a, the first servicing mission was scheduled with the corrective optics that were uh, uh, constructed uh, to fix spherical aberration. And so on the next slide, what I'm gonna show you is a, a brief film of about three seconds, uh, three minutes long, that uh, just shows you some of the activity of the servicing missions, the first of which really corrected the spherical aberration and caused the telescope to work greatly. So go ahead and yeah, punch that and let's play the movie. And I may uh, stop it at a certain point. So on the servicing missions, all of which uh, generally have been sort of the same, uh, the shuttle goes up for two and a half minutes, it rides those solid rocket boosters, which are then uh, ejected. And the astronauts call it, they're riding the fire until those things are uh, ejected. And then the telescope, uh, sorry, the shuttle continues to the telescope on the main engine of the shuttle. And within 24 hours, it catches up with the, the telescope. It mates with it. 
and two teams of two astronauts each spend alternate days going out for eight hours every 24 hours and uh, doing repair work. It uh, turns out they can work outside for eight hours because that's the maximum length of time that they can uh, take their consumables out in the spacesuit. So stop, stop the movie here for a sec. Just hit. Oh. Yeah, that's all right. We'll, we'll get through this. Go ahead and go back. And yeah, I'm just, let's put it over there. Exactly. Hit, no, hit the hit at that spot. This is good enough. Um, well, well, we'll let the uh, we'll let the movie go. And I'll have you uh, stop it in a minute when they're up at the telescope again. Okay, stop it there. Just hit, uh, put the cursor right. Great. Um, so, and each one of the teams of astronauts, there are two of them. One of them has their feet planted in the Canada arm, the remote manipulator system, as it's called. The, uh, and then you can see there, again, I can't use the cursor, but uh, maybe Victor can point the cursor over to the feet of one of the astronauts who's anchored in the arm there. And to the left, you see the array of instruments that uh, the drills, uh, wrenches, and the like that enable uh, him or her, because there has been a female, uh, Catherine Thornton, who's worked on this. In fact, others, Megan Donahue, um, um, uh, during the uh, uh, um, spacewalks. Notice the yellow um, handrails around the telescope. There's a big vertical one to the right, that's right, and then two of them horizontal above that. And it turns out, yeah, up there. So it turns out there are 90 of those yellow handrails that the other member who's a so-called free floater can hold on to when they're helping the other astronaut who's uh, doing the main work because uh, he or she's got the tools and their foot is anchored into that uh, Canada arm. Uh, go ahead and uh, let the movie play a little longer. The, the entire um, process in which they do their renovation is choreographed like a ballet. And, and it's uh, uh, largely uh, uh, because you're limited by the eight hours uh, that you can stay out there. Stop it right here. Um, okay, yeah, let me go back and just gonna have to guess where we were. It turns out that because the telescope is in the dark half the time and in light half the time, there are some things that can be done only when you're, you have good lighting. And other things that can be done when the telescope is cool and certain parts uh, fit better. Go ahead and stop it here for a minute. Um, in any event, so there have been five servicing missions where they've gone through all of this and they've worked wonderfully well. And when they're through, the last thing that they do, and this is an image that you can see here, is before they back the shuttle away from the telescope, and they have to do it using hydrazine, which is a possible contaminant, you have to open that shutter door that you see uh, uh, down at the uh, bottom of the telescope there. And the reason for that is that obviously if it became stuck, uh, and the, the, the shuttle has already moved away from it, uh, you'd have a problem. And so they open the door and then they gently nudge the telescope away with light firings of hydrazine over a period of some hours to move the shuttle far enough away that there's no contamination and then bid the telescope adieu for that particular servicing mission. So this is what it looked like, one of the last pictures that was taken of the shuttle because this was from the last servicing mission. And then go ahead and play the end of the movie, which is only another 15 or 20 seconds. Uh, then they come down to land. And there you see the ion tail behind the shuttle as they're going through the atmosphere. And this particular landing, because of bad weather in Florida, they landed at uh, Edwards Air Force Base in, in California. So um, the shuttles are considered to be perhaps uh, the servicing missions, uh, NASA's uh, second greatest achievement, obviously after the Apollo and the moon program, but the fact that they were able to do such complicated work in space was really uh, quite remarkable. So uh, 
Next slide, you can see what the results of the uh, servicing mission resulted. In fact, you have a spherical aberration on the left image and on the right, you have an image after the corrective optics have been installed. And in fact, the telescope worked to specs after the first servicing mission. We gave up only 4% in throughput and 4% uh, in a decrease in the field of view. And after that, which occurred in 1993, go ahead, next slide. In fact, with the telescope working superbly, uh, this is um, what the telescope has, uh, uh, means to the public actually some uh, very nice images that are all available in the public domain on hubblesite.org. Um, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but on the right, uh, these are some of the iconic images basically of the Hubble. You, it's uh, made impressive images of transients, that is uh, stars that uh, go into outburst. And over here on the right, you can see um, some nebulae, uh, planetary nebula in the lower right there. Um, let's see, what is that, uh, P. Cygni that uh, uh, went into outburst and uh, because of the confinement by a magnetic field, it looks like two uh, lobes that look like brains, uh, a really a neat image there. A uh, famous image up there at the top middle, the pillars of so-called pillars of creation, star formation region. Up on the left, uh, the telescope devoted two entire weeks to observing the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 impact with Jupiter, uh, creating those bright star, uh, spots on impact that uh, reach temperatures of the surface of the sun and uh, remain for almost nine months uh, visible. Uh, on the lower left, um, spectacular, well-defined images of galaxies that are in the um, relatively near the uh, Milky Way that have enabled us to determine the uh, population synthesis of galaxies, chemical compositions. So all sorts of really fundamental stuff that the, that the telescope has done. Um, next slide. So what I'd like to do now is uh, shift basically to the um, topic at hand, and that is uh, focus on Hubble's work and uh, distant galaxies. Um, and so let me remind you of two concepts that I think you already know. Go ahead to the next slide. The first concept that you all know is that uh, when you look out in space, you're looking back in time because of a finite velocity of light, 300,000 kilometers a second. And so of all of the scientific endeavors on Earth, those which study the past, with the exception of astronomy, have to depend upon the discovery of artifacts, which are then subject to interpretation. Astronomy, we have this fantastic situation where we actually can see the past simply because of the finite uh, light travel time. So the further out you look, further back in time you're looking. The one uh, problem with that, of course, is in looking back in time, you're looking further away. And since the apparent brightness of any object varies as it went over the square of the distance, uh, objects get fainter as you get further away. And so you can only see so far with a given telescope. And this is the virtue of Hubble. There, it has these two aspects. First of all, because it's above the Earth's atmosphere, it has a low background. You don't have the scattering from the Earth's atmosphere. And secondly, it uh, has such good spatial resolution that in fact, a given amount of light can be focused on a fewer number of pixels. And since you always have to combat the electronic noise, of any electric, uh, electronic detector. Uh, Hubble really is the ideal telescope um, up there in space to look for uh, distant objects. So that's the uh, one uh, concept. Next slide shows the second concept, again, that you all know, and that is that we live in an expanding universe. And that is really fundamental. Um, go ahead and play the, the, the movie, it only takes. Um, 
due to Edwin Hubble and George Lemaitre, who is now given equal credit because although he advocated a uniformly expanding universe uh, with much less accuracy than Hubble, he was correct in actually suggesting it at the same time of Hubble, even though Hubble used uh, Cepheid variables to get distances and therefore uh, his determination of the expansion was uh, much more exact. But the point is that, uh, go ahead and stop it for a sec. If you look at each individual galaxy there as they're expanding, the galaxies are gravitationally bound and therefore they are not increasing in size, but the space between them is. And what Hubble particularly showed when he determined the distances to galaxies, and of course he did it by using pulsating stars, Cepheid variables, the standard candles, he was able to look out from the brightnesses of these stars in the different galaxies and determine their distances through the Doppler effect, right? You all know that. Any object that's moving with respect to the observer will emit waves that are stretched longer if the object's receding and will be compressed to shorter wavelengths if they're approaching. So he used the Doppler effect to get the velocities and he was able to get the distances from the apparent brightnesses of the stars in the galaxy. So he, it was Hubble who came up with a so-called velocity distance relationship, showing that the velocities of all of the galaxies generally was related to their distance. In other words, space was uniformly expanding. And this was profound because it indicated that space, the universe was universally expanding, and therefore you could project backwards in time to what it must have been like in the past and deduce that there was a beginning. So the whole concept of a beginning, which because it's expanding must have been caused by energy, and therefore it presumably started with what Fred Hoyle derisively called a big bang, uh, and it was sarcastic, but the name was stuck. So there was a big bang that initiated all of this. We don't know why or how, because we don't have those facts known yet, but have an expanding universe. So you project back in time. So the fundamental cosmology that came from this was that, go ahead and show the next slide. You could symbolize or project the history of the universe in terms of a cone, that started off small at a particular time, which depending upon the expansion rate of the universe, turned out to be 14 billion years. So if we plot this projected history of the universe where time goes from left to right, there you see, and at the present time, 14 billion years after the Big Bang, we see ourselves there, you know, with galaxies. We look out, we see the Virgo and Coma Cluster. We see galaxies, you know, we know what the current epoch of the universe looks like. The fact is, if we project back in time to try to determine what the evolution of the universe has been that has produced what we now see in the form of galaxies by applying physical laws, laws of thermodynamics. Anytime you expand the gas, it gets cooler and less dense. Anytime you compress it, it gets more dense and hotter. We project that in the past, the universe must have been really hot. We know that anything that's hot radiates and therefore, Physicists and astronomers realized shortly after, you know, Hubble's and Lemaitre's work, that if uh, uh, this idea of an expanding universe was correct, we should be able to look out far enough, we didn't know exactly how far, and see if there was this faint hot fog that represented the early state of the universe. Again, looking back in time, Meaning, looking back billions of, of uh, out, looking back billions of light years. So, in fact, in the 1990s, a uh, next slide, a uh, satellite, Kobe satellite, was built by NASA. You see it up there in the upper left, and it's been subsequently um, uh, followed up by well, several satellites. WMAP, the Wilkinson, uh, again another Princeton. Uh, a person, uh, which is down in the uh, lower left there. 
And then the uh, Europeans with their Planck satellite, small telescopes that have looked for this faint glow that uh, should exist, we believe, and see if they could detect it by looking in between all of the stars, any holes in our Milky Way where there's not much obscuration. So these are observations that are very sensitive that uh, have to take uh, a place over years to build up the signal to detect what might well be a very faint glow. And by the way, that faint glow, because we are trying to detect it at such great distances, which because of the redshift, right, the expanding universe, means that that radiation, which due to hot gas, would normally be in the visible, but because of its redshift is shifted into the microwave, um, was in, in the microwave. And in fact, Kobe spent several years in the 90s trying to detect it and succeeded. And the map that came out of Kobe and has been now confirmed by WMAP and by Planck is shown there, uh, you see in this slide. Um, it is a really faint glow that is remarkable in two ways. First of all, well, it exists. Uh, secondly, it, this glow is incredibly homogeneous. Now, I tried to project it there in a way where if you've got a good laptop and your connection's good, you will see that although there's this pretty uniform kind of yellowish green color there, there are uh, inhomogeneities in the intensity. And what that means is that, uh, first of all, the homogeneity of the back background radiation is one part, three parts in 100,000. I mean, it, 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 it is more homogeneous than the air of any of your rooms. <laughs> but there are these inhomogeneities in temperature and density that you see, teeny so-called micro fluctuations that are a result of the inflation of the universe. And, and uh, so they exist. Yes, that is, it was homogeneous, but not perfectly so. So uh, this resulted uh, in the Nobel Prize to the team, um, uh, particularly John Mather at, at Goddard, for the detection of this. Of course, it had been predicted by Gamow and, and other people. Uh, you know, there are so many people, a number of Princeton, of course, you know, Jim Peebles, um, who uh, had a, a part of this, David Wilkinson. Uh, and the question then that we all asked was, okay, it looks like billions of years ago, uh, there was this hot phase in the universe and it looks like it was, there was no structure. It was really uniform. So how did the universe evolve from this state to, next slide, the point where on the right, we now have galaxies. So this was the task of astronomy. First of all, there was confirmation that there was this hot fog. And in fact, that hot fog, which you see when the temperature of the universe at that point, it turns out 400,000 years after the Big Bang was about four or 5,000 degrees Kelvin. It did radiate. And that fog prevents us from actually seeing further back toward the Big Bang, um, uh, because just like a fog, it, it, it blocks the radiation from beyond that. So the fact is we can use our telescopes now, whether in the visible or radio or a microwave in particular, to look back that far, but it's very difficult, if even possible, to look back further than that because this fog prevents that. Uh, let me say one other thing about the Big Bang. A lot of people wonder, well, if you really have the universe compressed in this in incredibly dense state, how can you pack all this material into something so dense? And the answer is there was no matter then. Remember Einstein's equivalence of mass and energy e equals mc squared. You can create mass out of energy and you can create energy out of mass. So the fact is we now believe at the instant of the Big Bang, there was no mass. There was energy, don't know where that came from, okay? But there was energy and it was that energy that subsequently, hey, in millions of 
the second, uh, created the mass that, that we now see. So the uh, task of astronomers was, uh, once this basic cos cosmology had been confirmed, was how can we uh, look back and uh, try to determine exactly, and I wish I had the cursor, but what's in that, what's in that dark spot there where it says Hubble Space Telescope? So go to the next slide. So this actually was one of the missions of space telescopes. Um, but it turns out before, so this was, uh, Kobe did this in the, in the 90s. Before we got the instruments to actually attack this observationally, the theoretical physicists and astrophysicists got the jump on us and used known physical laws to predict what they thought we should see. Starting from the COBE results with these small inhomogeneities, they asked the question, if you have small inhomogeneities, small in this case, we're talking of million, hundreds of millions of light years in size, uh, but, but uh, you know, um, an inhomogeneity that is a density only one part in 10,000 more dense than its surrounding, could that gas, as it expands, have inhomogeneities that were large enough that that barely more dense gas could actually gravitationally condense and form structure. And so that was the fundamental question, or one of them, of cosmology. How could we understand from a homogeneous initial universe the presence now of such inhomogeneities uh, where we're all walking on hardwood floors, we're living on solid planets and the like? So the, the theoreticians then took that situation and predicted what you will see now in the 17 second movie that has been done by a number of groups, but this, this was a nice presentation. Okay, starting with these inhomogeneities and look up at the right, as time goes on to six giga years, seven, exactly what they predicted the structure of the universe should be over 14 billion, 14 giga years. And this is what they got. What they found was that if you take these inhomogeneities that came from cosmic inflation, even though they were teeny inhomogeneities, that would be enough that the most dense of them, the largest of them, could condense, gravitationally contract, and form more massive, hotter structures. And so what you're seeing is what they predicted the universe should look like now. So question is, does the universe look this way? Next slide. Answer is yes. Again, one of the uh, uh, great surveys that uh, it had its origin uh, there at Princeton, Jerry Ostreicher, um, um, let's see who else, Jim Gunn uh, advocated the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, a number of uh, different organizations have uh, undertaken that. And this basically using a, a number of telescopes where they looked uh, at all places in the sky, uh, except in the plane of the Milky Way where obscuration uh, prevents it, basically mapped out the structure of the so-called current local universe out to a billion light years. And this is what you see. You see this cosmic web that was exactly predicted by the theoreticians. So this is what the universe looks like now. And we believe that we understand the basics of how it got that way from the original few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang with that uh, little teeny bit of inhomogeneity uh, has produced uh, this. So next slide. So this is what we now have uh, been using Hubble Space Telescope to try to uh, get a better handle on uh, in detail what can we say about the progression of the universe from the left hand there, um, where that cosmic web starts, out to local times. Uh, next slide. So Hubble uh, Telescope, some of the early um, 
programs on the telescope actually were devoted uh, to this question. Um, it, it's interesting, at the, at the very month of launch, John Bacall, again, uh, Institute of Advanced Study, uh, uh, quite an influential person there at, at Princeton, sadly now gone, although Netta is still there. She, I'm sure, must be known to some of you in the, the Amateur Association, undertook several programs when the telescope was still spherically aberrated. Remember, it operated with spherical aberration for three years before the first servicing mission. So some of the early programs on the telescope um, worked with it uh, when it was spherically aberrated. But there were optical, um, there, there were program, there were ways in which since we knew exactly how much spherical aberration there was, there were actually procedures that enabled us to uh, mathematically correct largely for that spherical aberration. And so there were some programs, one of which there's called the medium D survey, that randomly took pictures of galaxies, not knowing what their distance was, but they were faint. Um, and then spectra were eventually obtained to them so we could get their distances, just to see what distant galaxies might look like. Um, you know, do they look the same as normal galaxies, which you see over there on the right? You know, the famous Hubble sequence, present epoch there, where uh, galaxies tend to be these large structures, tend to be fairly symmetrical. They either have a spiral shape, just in general, or this uh, smooth elliptical shape, although there are some irregulars, like the Magellanic Cloud that you see there in the lower right of that uh, uh, panel on the right. Uh, and they, they clearly didn't. There was another program uh, that Alan Dressler and Jim Gunn undertook of a cluster of galaxies, you see the name there, 0939 plus 4713, that they knew its distance, 4 billion light years, which was the largest distance that any ground-based telescope had been able to look. And again, spherically aberrated, images corrected. And you can see a bunch of, this is a, a thumbnails of uh, the galaxies in this cluster of galaxies there. And none of them look like the, the local galaxies, the Hubble sequence. They're, uh, they're very amorphous, no symmetry. Some of them are one arm spirals or three arm. They have double nuclei. I mean, they're almost all strange. None of them look like anything that, that we see out now galaxies. The it was that uh, there it did appear that the uh, galaxies, the morphology, the structure of galaxies had evolved, and we were actually seeing uh, a part of that evolution uh, when we could look back four billion light years. So uh, at the Institute, as soon as spherical aberration was corrected, um, we were made uh, aware of a very important that was undertaken by a postdoc that changed everything. It was one of these incredible, and if you'll forgive me, my voice is giving out and I'm gonna run in and get a glass of water, okay? <laughs> so this will take uh, 20 seconds. But go to the next slide when I come back. Uh, hopefully, I'll um, prevent this uh, throat from getting a little more hoarse. Go to the next slide. Yeah. So, one of the uh, aha moments in my professional life, there was a young postdoc at the institute. We're back on, okay? Every, everyone cool? Great. Yeah, we can hear you, fine. Okay. I'm drinking a little water here. Mark Dickinson had just finished his PhD at Berkeley, working with high spin red, came to the Institute, and he was studying radio galaxies. 
and he'd gotten a position at the Institute, and he knew that the telescope was going to be fixed, and uh, he had a Keck telescope, the 10 meter, had just come online. This is a faint galaxy, and he he um, and it was a very strange radio emitter, and so he was just curious. Uh, there's a cluster of galaxies. You see an image. This is a Hubble image, one of the first. In fact, it was the first deep image taken. This is in uh, 93, uh, 94, excuse me, early 94. And the redshift of the galaxy was it, from spectra at Keck turned out to be very great. A redshift of 1.3 for those of you who know it. In other words, the distance line Uh, years and certainly ground base. I'm I'm actually losing your audio. I don't know if others are. Victor, yes, uh, yes, we're losing your audio, Bob. Uh, Sam, I can do about it. Maybe just lost the last thirty seconds. That's all. Um. So uh, here was an image. We had science coffee at the Institute every day. Um, um, uh, and a group of us, and I was director at that time. And we'd get up there and we'd just talk about uh, what Hubble was doing. I'll never forget the morning. Mark came in. He had had a, this program to image this galaxy, very faint, uh, for 32 orbits. That's two full days of Hubble. That was by far the longest uh, observation that Hubble had been uh, made by far. And uh, he was fortunate in uh, basically being an unknown, you know, just out of graduate school <laughs> postdoc, uh, who got it approved, and he showed this to us. And we said, wow, you know, interesting picture. You know, how far away is a galaxy? And he gave the redshift and our eyes just popped out. Nine billion light years away. Incredible. So you see the detail there on the right. This was really the beginning of Hubble searching distant galaxies when it had been thought that it would not be successful in doing so. But look there in the upper right. That's uh, one of the galaxies, and then the actual radio source is the one that is shown down there in the lower right. Uh, talk about a strange looking galaxy that doesn't look anything like galaxies of the modern age. Now, the reason this was such a surprise was John Bacall had written a paper and who had, had together with Lyman Spitzer, much to do with the success of Hubble Space Telescope. He wrote a paper in Science Magazine the month of launch in 1990, predicting what Hubble's contributions would be. And he listed a number of them. John's a smart guy, really. And nothing he said, whether or not he turned out to be right or wrong, that, that hadn't had a lot of thought put into it. One of the things that he said was he did not, and he did this with two other people, uh, Schneider and uh, Roger Guathakurta, who's a, now a colleague of mine at Santa Cruz. In this paper, they said, we do not expect that Hubble will discover new types of distant objects. And they had good reason to suggest that, having to do with the fact that there is this cosmological effect that the apparent sizes of galaxies after you get to a certain distance, which is about seven or eight billion light years, uh, causes them to appear bigger. Now that, that, that's fine, except when you take any image and you make it bigger, you also make it fainter. And so if there's a problem with detecting that something faint and you make its surface brightness fainter, then you'll have a harder time detecting it against any background, whether it's the electronic noise of your detector or just cosmic microwave background or whatever. And so uh, John uh, really uh, indicated to the community that we should be very careful about taking large amounts of time looking for distant galaxies with Hubble Space Telescope. 
And this image basically showed not necessarily so for various reasons that I won't go into right now, other than the fact that I can say that what John and his collaborators didn't take into account was the fact that when you increase the size from cosmological effects of these distant galaxies. Yeah. So anyway, uh, this caused us to to uh, realize that um, in spite of the predictions that we were not likely to succeed, in fact, Hubble could do a unexpectedly good job. Uh, so uh, next slide. So one of the interesting aspects of Hubble Space Telescope contract with Goddard which was very unique at that time was that the director of Space Telescope Institute had 10% of the time at his or her disposal uh, without peer review or anything. This was a perk of the job and uh, my annual performance evaluation was based on how I used that. And as soon as I saw that image taken by Mark Dickinson, their picture on the right of uh, there, together with his colleague, a Hubble fellow who all, already, uh, also was a new recruit to the Institute, Harry Ferguson, uh, at Science Coffee in the library, and that's an image of us <laughs> at one of our discussions uh, taken 25 years ago, told them, hey, we have to devote most of my 10%, which is a huge amount of time, to pursuing distant galaxies, as a follow-up to what Mark Dickinson's picture showed. And so uh, we've already taken enough time here, uh, I'm afraid, with uh, the problems with the, the link. So let me make a long story short and say that I convened a committee of experts to advise me on how they thought 10% of the time, which basically was 20 nights on the, on the telescope, uh, used to search for distant galaxies. And, and after that committee, uh, which had vectors that went every direction, that is, they came to no consensus. They were all arguing with themselves about the best way to do things. And so I went to 15 of these young scientists, none of whom had permanent jobs. They were all uh, postdocs, uh, with one exception, Mark Postman, <laughs> who some of you may know because he spent time at Princeton. Um, that, that we need to take this under our wing and uh, do something to try to detect the most distant galaxies to look to see what how galaxies uh, form. And so, so the questions we asked are there. What field should we do? Should we focus on one field and go really deep? Or uh, because we would be confining ourselves in one field to just one special small part of the universe, should we take multiple? Um, what if we, the telescope had just been fixed at a cost of a billion dollars for that servicing mission. The public was still uh, very uncertain about the value of Hubble. Uh, what if we uh, undertook a program and came up with no results? The, the public would really be on us again in the scientific community. And so the question was, should we actually look at some uh, cluster of galaxies that we thought was very distant to at least make sure that we ended up imaging something? Or should we just point the thing out there in an undistinguished area of the sky and uh, take our chances? What filter should we use? The, um, uh, there's one filter in particular in the red that had higher throughput and therefore was the most sensitive filter. So should we just focus on that high throughput filter to get as deep as we could? Or since different filters uh, displaying different colors can actually give you some information, should we distribute over some filters, particularly some that in the blue would give you information but had very poor throughput? How many orbits should we devote? Should I devote all of my, the orbits that I had? Ah, and then since these were all young postdocs with no positions, should we keep the data proprietary, which we're entitled to do for one year under NASA, so all these guys could uh, analyze it and would be, you know, uh, assure them of great futures, or be, should we do this as a community service and uh, make it uh, available 
immediately to the public. And not only that, should we not only make the data public, but should we go ahead and take, go to all the effort to calibrate and enhance the data set, because we know that telescope better than anyone else, and give the community a really superb data set that we have not used for our own research, and they can take it away. And then lastly, producing a good picture, if it turns out to be that, it means nothing unless you can get the distances from the spectra of the galaxies in order to interpret, right? So, uh, um, and knowing that, what we did was we selected a field that eventually we called it Hubble Deep Field, and we told Keck Telescope, which is operated by Hawaii, Caltech, and University of California, that we were going to do this. Eh, I'm just getting assigned again. My internet connection's unstable. Uh, are you still hearing me? Yes. Okay. So we asked Keck to start getting spectra of these galaxies so we would know their distances, their redshifts, when we eventually got the image. And they did that. So the next slide. Uh, um, we selected a field that uh, was in a, a very uh, distant uh, from the plane of the Milky Way galaxy and therefore um, suffered no obscuration. And it was actually an um, area of the sky that was perpendicular to Hubble's orbit. So it was a patch of sky that in fact would allow, it was not occulted by the earth so we could actually look at it for 24 hours a day. Um, and this is what the Palomar survey image of that area of the sky looks like, two arc minutes on a side. And it was that area that we basically exposed at for more than 10 days uh, in several filters and uh, go ahead and hit return and produced the image that you'll see there as the Hubble Deep Field. And we had no idea what we were gonna get really. Uh, we knew from the Palomar Sky Survey there'd be a few galaxies, but that's the Hubble Deep Field. Blew us away. 340 images taken over 10 days, different filters. So we actually were able to get a color picture of it, but that wasn't why we did that. It was because the colors of the galaxies told us something about the hot blue stars and therefore the star formation rate. That's one of the fundamental results that have come out of this. So that was the Hubble Deep Field, a truly a shot in the dark. And uh, let me quickly here uh, give you what the results of this image that just on the face of it there is nothing but a pretty picture, right? I mean, um, the bright nearby galaxies, like those two white ones sort of vertically, uh, uh, you know, the middle and the top, uh, you would guess from the brightness and their size, they're probably nearby galaxies. But all those little dots in the background you know, they presumably are more distant, but not necessarily. Maybe galaxies, some galaxies are really intrinsically very small and nearby. So you had to get spectra of all these things. Impossible. If it takes Hubble 10 days to even pick up an image of these, it was only the brightest objects, the brightest hundred of the objects you see in this image that Keck was able to get spectra of and for which we could determine distances. So Keck did that. And in the next slide, it shows you basically now the results of how we can interpret the Hubble Deep Field. So it's only the brightest galaxies there, that bright enough for Keck to be able to get an image. So 100 of the brightest galaxies in the HDF Hubble Deep Field are plotted here in this plot of the intrinsic brightness, the luminosity increasing to the right, as a function of the look back time, the, the distance, right? Uh, up at the top, nearby galaxies, only a billion light years away. Down to the bottom, it turns out that most distant galaxies we were able to determine had distances slightly over 12 billion light years, which is roughly, it's over 90% of the time back to the Big Bang. So, 
What do we make from this picture where you see all of these galaxies in their real colors and in their actual, the same physical size, at a, the same the, the, the scale appropriate to their distance? Um, what do we make of that? Hit return so I can, it turns out, obviously you'll notice that there are no galaxies to the lower left and there are no galaxies to the upper right. Simple observational selection effects. Because there's a limit on how far the Hubble, any telescope can detect a galaxy as it gets further away, anything that falls to the left of the dotted white line there would be too faint to detect. So that's simply a selection effect due to the fact that you know, galaxies no doubt exist there, but we couldn't detect them. There are no galaxies to the upper right because we are looking out in this very narrow cone, size of a grain of sand at arm's length. Again, I'm getting um, a note here, internet connection unstable, so I'm not sure if you're losing some of what I'm saying. We can hear you, but Bob. Basically, okay, so there are no galaxies that we see to the upper right because the volume is too small, right? The, the volume of a cone uh, increases as you get further and further away. And so you don't see any in the upper right because the volume of space in, in our cone for the Hubble Deep Field is simply too small. They're just, uh, the really luminous galaxies are not that common. And so there just happened to be none there. So there's a selection effect that gives you this diagonal strip of galaxies that goes from upper left to lower right. So notice the following. First, all the galaxies, which have to be luminous if they're at very distant galaxies, down at the bottom, they're bluish. They're very small. They're smaller than the more redder galaxies. Uh, those that uh, have more uh, um, smoother shapes, uh, morphologically, structurally, you know, they, they're more symmetric up uh, at the top part of the diagram. So uh, we can draw some conclusions here. Uh, hit return again. If we do blow ups of the galaxies down at the bottom there, here's uh, the magnified, some of those galaxies down there. So this is really what galaxies 10 to 12 billion light years away look like. Again, nothing like the local epoch galaxies that you see up here, here labeled present, you know, the ellipticals, the spirals. So what the Hubble Deep Field says right here is there was this question of whether galaxy formation occurred top down or bottom up. That is when these initial inhomogeneities in the universe, you know, from the cosmic microwave background, when they uh, gravitationally collapsed to form structure, did the largest structures collapse first and then fragment into smaller structures that became the galaxies? That's top down. Or was it the opposite? Was a condensation actually uh, a more predominant among the smaller homogeneities, which formed small structures that merged together gravitationally and built up in structure? So what the Hubble Deep Field says is it's the bottom up uh, uh, picture that is correct that galaxy formation started from smaller bits that have gravitationally merged together. And in so doing through that merger process where they um, undergo the uh, collisions, gravitational collisions, that through the uh, transfer of angular momentum make them more symmetric. And so you actually have an evolution in time going from the lower right up to the upper left. So bottom up as a result. Next slide shows the other major result. And that is, if you look at these galaxies, they really grouped. And by the way, there is that uh, gap there in the middle where you see no galaxies. That is another selection effect called the redshift desert. It turns out 
that there are very few spectral lines for galaxies having that distance or that velocity that fall in the visible. And so it's very difficult to ascertain the distance of galaxies that happen to uh, fall in that region. So again, just a selection effect. But notice that all of that cluster of galaxies at about uh, 10 to 12 billion light years away, which is only a couple of billion years after the Big Bang, they're all blue. That means that all those objects were dominated by very hot massive stars, which tend to be bluish, meaning, and since massive stars have short lifetimes, that there was very large star formation going on initially. Whereas up at the top, all those red stars are cool stars that uh, are um, uh, very old. All the massive stars have already died out and what are left are the long lived stars like the sun. And so there's very little star formation going on. Important result, next slide, is that from an analysis of these galaxies, and this is one of the fundamental results of the Hubble Deep Field is that if we plot the rate of star formation as a function of look back time, you know, where Big Bang is off to the right at 14 billion years, you see that star formation started out slow at around 13 billion uh, years look back time. In other words, a billion, billion and a half years after the Big Bang, and then ramped up for three to four billion years to about 10 billion years ago, and was at a maximum before the expansion of the universe caused gas to be so tenuous that it was difficult for new stars to form because stars form from gravitational contraction. And, and so the previous star formation had used up most of the gas in the universe and what was left over between the stars became such low density that it's very difficult nowadays for stars to form. And so it has dropped off by actually almost a factor of 100 uh, going down there uh, uh, toward the left uh, to, to the lower left. So this is the history of star formation. It ramped up and we are now living in a dying universe. So very important um, uh, result. All of this came out of uh, the deep field. Um, let's see, how are we doing with time? I probably should, yeah, we're getting, we're getting a little late. Um, the, I was gonna show a couple of uh, images. Well, maybe I can do it very quickly. The, I've got two videos to show you. And then I uh, could say something about James Webb. Uh, maybe we'll take the break first and then address that after the break. Um, go to the next slide. Um, some very interesting results now have come about trying to determine, you know, if we believe this uh, evolution that we've seen that forms the cosmic web, a number of groups have used very high powered computers now, taking a month of computer time on the most advanced computers, taking a little spot in the early universe and trying to determine in an expanding universe where you have inhomogeneities, can we explain how galaxies form? And if you go to the next slide, there's a short video where uh, Piero Madao, uh, again, colleague at Santa Cruz, and who was part of the deep field team at the Institute uh, before he uh, moved to a professorship in Santa Cruz, uh, with a team at the University of Zurich using uh, high powered computers, exactly did this movie where they took a little bit of gas in the un uh, early universe and uh, uh, just saw how uh, with a certain random motions, go ahead and keep, keep it going, how you might start with these diffuse gas blobs and have them gravitationally interact with their own angular momentum. You always conserve angular momentum. And what you will see is that they showed, and others have confirmed this, that spiral galaxies will form out of this particular situation. There you see right there, a spiral galaxy forming. And it can do that in some 100 million years. 
So this is uh, the, the formation of spiral galaxies appears to be a natural phenomenon. Let's go to the uh, last picture, the next slide, which takes a couple of spiral galaxies. This was done by John Dubinsky and uh, followed this, start this. So if spiral galaxies can form in the early universe, Suppose you get a couple of them gravitationally merging. What do you end up with? And uh, here's a nice little computation that he did that shows them interacting where tidal forces cause some of the stars in the outer parts of the galaxies to sort of be flung out and escape at the greater distances but the nuclei where most of the mass of the galaxy is cause uh, them eventually to merge. And if we can keep this going for another couple of seconds, what you'll end up with was starting with two spiral galaxies, you end up with a merged galaxy that has obliterated the spiral pattern and in fact takes on a fairly uniform morphology, very similar to elliptical galaxies. And so the point is, we believe that spiral galaxies can form from the early universe, and then those that tend to merge, go ahead and stop it there. I think it, it ends about this point. And there you have the formation of an elliptical galaxy. So we believe, and this is a bit over, overly simplistic, this is how the two types of galaxies over billions of years have uh, taken shape. So all of this uh, interesting stuff, and it has essentially come out of the imaging of uh, Hubble Space Telescope. So um, let me uh, give it back to you. And if there are any questions about this or about James Webb, I can uh, address those after we take a, a short break. Should we do it that way? OK, I don't know if it makes a difference. I'll go ahead and stop my own video. Just, um, okay, so there's the web, and that's actually what it looks like. Uh, again, any of you who've been following it, the deployment of the secondary, the, the, the wing flaps and the mirrors, the, um, the mylar that uh, protects the telescope, keeps it cold, because it really does have to uh, operate at a temperature uh, no greater than 70 degrees Kelvin. And the temperature of the mirrors was first measured today. I started taking their, they're leaving. So all the instruments are down there in the lower part, of course, because with their electronics, they're sources of heat. And you got to keep that temperature cold because in the far infrared, the telescope will radiate. And that, that's well known. And it turns out for the temperatures, sorry, for the uh, wavelengths that the, the, the web is sensitive to, uh, out to uh, not quite 100 uh, microns. Uh, it has to remain at 70 degrees Kelvin. And uh, the mirrors uh, today were at uh, 98, 98 and a half degrees. So they measured uh, every one of the uh, was it 17 or 18 hex uh, mirrors there. And so, so they're getting down there. It's going to be another four months uh, when the instruments are brought up. Um, you know, everything is calibrated and the mirrors have to be aligned, uh, no images uh, for four more months. But once the telescope gets work and show the next slide, and that is that uh, we were able to get within one and a half billion years of the Big Bang and uh, the James Webb should get us down to within one, there we go, to within one billion. So you can see in this, uh, here that if you look, whole deep field there, I got to uh, about 1.7 billion years and notice the J JWST deep field goes down there and gets us to within about 600 million, uh, right at the time when uh, the first galaxies are believed to have uh, formed. And so deep fields with the uh, James Webb are, are really gonna reveal even stranger <laughs> looking galaxies. So show the next slide, which basically goes through the sequence that has just been completed, right? Going there from upper left around to the right and then back down to lower left. There were all of these things that have occurred in the past two weeks since Christmas day. The, uh, the most sensitive was the mylar 
heat shields that had to be deployed, all five of them, because the mylar is very thin and is torn before. So it uh, was successfully deployed and stretched. Then the, the, the mirror flaps, the side mirrors, uh, down on the furthest right, they were brought out, and that was just this past Saturday. Um, the secondary strut, sorry, the, the secondary strut was done on Saturday, and then the mirrors were deployed just a couple of days ago. And right now, the major deployment of the structure has uh, taken place. And so the telescope is there as it is to be used. And for the next four months, uh, the major uh, activity will be just letting it cool down to get from its current 98 Kelvin to 70 Kelvin. And then it will start taking images and um, during its uh, uh, research. So why don't I go ahead and take questions at this point? There were some in the chat. Yeah, so how much longer will the Hubble be usable? And once it's gone, what will replace the parts of the spectrum that James Webb uh, cannot assume? That was one came in from uh, Eileen. So the amazing thing is that the last servicing mission was 2009. So that was essentially 19 years. There, there were five servicing missions in the first 19, let's say 20 years. That was an average of one every four years. And they were always needed for something. There's some part and failed. Gyroscopes definitely need replacing batteries. Um, and yet since 2009, so what's that? That's 12 and a half years, almost 13 this April. Telescope has had no servicing missions and, and <laughs> there's, it suffered no major failures. Um, it is getting arthritis in the detectors. Uh, pixels are going bad, uh, losing some sensitivity, but the telescope is still working uh, dandily. But the fact is, uh, like with humans, uh, you can't, uh, you know, it's mortal. Um, um, <laughs> and the instruments are degrading. And so how long will the telescope go? Well, based on the failure rate of the first 20 years when we were able to service it, we would have guessed we'd be lucky to get five years out of it. We've gotten 12. And so I have to tell you that every weekend, I wonder if I'm not gonna log on on Monday and uh, it will, some, some uh, major failure will have occurred and that's it. So all I can say is the telescope has lived uh, beyond its expectations. On the other hand, space is really a harsh environment and so, you know, we couldn't, can't guarantee anything. I can't say I'd be surprised if it lasts another five years. Uh, it, it, it may, uh, but we just can't tell. And I suspect there will be some failures that might take instruments out, but other instruments would still uh, work. Eventually, it's the gyroscopes that will go. And um, we know how to operate the telescope on two of them. We've got three now. Uh, and there are some things we can actually do with one gyroscope, but the lifetime of those gyros, uh, they have a half-life now at this point of another two to three years. So I would expect that uh, mortality <laughs> in one way or another will, will occur in the next, um, in some form in the next couple of years. Uh, NASA is happy as long as we can get data out of it to continue funding it. We would like, because it looks indivisible, it would be great to have both it and web looking at the same thing. And let's see, one of the parts of the question was, uh, what do we do when there's no Hubble? Right now, uh, it won't be until the Nancy Roman telescope gets up and that is now scheduled for launch 2027. So there would be nothing comparable to what Hubble can do in the visible until at least 2027. Hey, hey, Victor, it, it's Rich. I was wondering if I might uh, dovetail on that question, that last question. Uh, sure, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Doctor, um, I had re read the Extraterrestrial book by Dr. Avi Loeb up in Harvard, which is fairly controversial. But one of his points is, is that the scientific value of Hubble has largely and, and for a long time exceeded its estimated life and value. Much more information 
much more imagery, much more detail has come in and data has come in than originally predicted. And I think you just highlighted that in what, in your last comments. Web has an estimated life of approximately 10 years. Is there something essentially different? Um, maybe the temperature, the distance, something else, the mylar, I, I don't know, that, that, that suggests that web will only last for 10 years, or would you not be surprised to see it last longer as Hubble has? That's my question. Thank you. Hard to say. Uh, in some ways, the web operation is simpler. In, in many ways, it's much more complex. Um, <clears throat> it's usually the electronics. Um, uh, all this uh, stuff is uh, subjected to cosmic rays. And, and uh, you know, they do damage to the electronics. <laughs> uh, some of it's repairable. Uh, the cosmic ray hits some of the software and it, you, you get strange commands will make the telescope do crazy things. <clears throat> Excuse me, you can always reboot and correct a lot of them. But, but sooner or later, um, bleep is going to happen. But it's hard to predict um, exactly when that will be because in the case of Hubble, we had experience with lots of probes and uh, other things being in a uh, low Earth orbit. And so we knew what the, the atmosphere would do. We knew what the solar wind was like. <clears throat> so we could actually do modeling that uh, showed us essentially that after every servicing mission where you assume the Hubble was at 100%, uh, a major failure that could be defined in, in various ways was 50% uh, likely within four and a half years. And in fact, uh, for the first 20 years, it, it followed that uh, uh, pretty much in the sense that every four years there was a failure, but that's how often we had the servicing missions. The curious thing is it's done much better than that uh, since 2009. In the case of Webb, can't tell. The one thing we know is the um, solar array should be fine. Um, and it is essentially the positioning of the telescope because you always have to keep that mylar pointed um, so it's uh, perpendicular to the direction of the earth and the sun. And that requires uh, the uh, propellant. And we have 10 years of that now, or a little more. In fact, it was just announced today. They think they've got uh, well over 10 years, uh, perhaps even up to 15. So if nothing else bad happened, can't guarantee that at all. Uh, right now, there is nothing that absolutely limits us on the lifetime of the web uh, to um, anything less than 15 years. So, uh, Professor Williams, uh, do you foresee uh, coordinated observing projects with Webb and Hubble? So oh, that, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yes, they're already there. That was a part of the deal with the, uh, the first uh, cycle, uh, which we conducted uh, this past year. So the fact is there are some coordinated uh, programs. And they will start as soon as the commissioning is finished and the commissioning is uh, to be done by the middle of this summer. And so those coordinated programs will be in. Oh, that's terrific. All right, any, any other questions? Yes, I, I, I have a question. Um, uh, Professor, this might be more not Hubble related, but I was fascinated by your um, map of basically the uh, galaxy. Uh, I don't know if you have a chance you could show us where, not, not the galaxy, but the universe, where our galaxy is located. And I noticed that the galaxy looks like two cones uh, together. And that, that cone section where they come together seems to be a very small part of the galaxy. Can Is it feasible to leave the, I mean, the universe, two, you know, the two cone sections of the universe? Can somebody leave the universe at that point? Or no, no, let's see. Uh, yeah, I keep going back. This was, uh, let's see, I can tell you the slide number because I've got it on a separate. Yeah, it was like two mark. cones and look like, can you leave the universe? And is the 16. other. 16, hit 16 there. Yes, yes. No. And is the other universe a, a, no, a no. alternate universe? So, okay. The two cones there are where the plane of the Milky Way goes and they obscure everything. 
And therefore, if we're trying to look out unimpeded to a distance of a billion light years, you cannot look within about 15 to 20 degrees of the plane of the galaxy simply because of all the obscuration. So the point is that there's galaxies there. It's just that Sloan didn't observe there just because of all the dust and gas in the galaxy. Okay, so you can't pinpoint on that map where the Milky Way oh, is. Oh, we're at the center. Oh, we're at the center. I mean, yeah, we're at the center, right. So we can leave the uh, the universe pretty right quick. Uh, why do you say that? Well, it's 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 narrow, very narrow there. Then at the other side of the cone, so yeah, you know, we can ex you know, I mean, not today's technology, but it's feasible that you can leave the uh, universe in um, that like black section that you know the two cones come together. Um, all of this is a spatial distribution of galaxies. And so by definition, because we're placing ourselves at the center, um, because this is where we made the observations, oh, okay, I, okay. I, I don't quite follow your uh, conclusion about our ability to leave. Well, again, all this is is a map, essentially. Uh, yeah, it's just basically that there, there's black map, you know, black space at the center where the ah, two no no are. again that that, that that's uh, the galaxies are there we just can't determine oh. that they're there because they're obscured okay and and do you believe in the uh, theory of an uh, alternate universe um yes and no there's no evidence for it sure but there's no evidence against it mm -hmm. So, you. you know, science addresses those things about which we have facts. So one can speculate. Well, in fact, one could ask a common question, ask what happened before the Big Bang? Yeah. Uh, that's big. So I, I have personally trouble in conceptualizing anything that's infinite. Uh, it, uh, for example, uh, mathematically, we say the universe is infinite in size. And that is because, in fact, mm -hmm. in our mathematical simulations, it's a good approximation to make. But if you ask me to explain, uh, you know, how can something be infinite? I can't do it. So yeah. the point is, I cannot imagine anything uh, that's infinite back in time, that there's a beginning, at, at, you know, because you can always ask what was before the beginning. So it's very difficult for me to conceive of that. So how can I possibly explain it? But the fact is, we do know that there was something that occurred 14 billion years ago. And we do have some facts about that that are consistent with, don't prove it, but that are consistent with. So anyone could ask, I, you, what happened before that? And the answer to that is, don't know. We uh -huh. don't yet have any facts about, and we're not able to get facts at this time about what might have happened before the Big Bang. I'm not a betting man, but if I had to make a bet, I would bet that in another century, our understanding of the physical world and physics will have improved such that we may actually be able to infer information about what may have happened before the Big Bang. Just a guess, but uh, in your- But right now the answer is don't know. Don't have facts, don't know. Dr. Williams, here's a quick question just based on the data and the, the theory or the, the, I should say the consequences that you derive from that the rate of star formation as a function of look back time. How would you, I guess, speculate or what would theory predict about the rate of planetary formation? Does it follow more or less the rate of star formation or is planetary system formation more likely to be a recent event because of the material and its presence in, in protoplanetary disks and so forth? Can you just give a quick answer to that? Yeah, both. <laughs> um, we don't know a lot of uncertainty. But there is, uh, uh, yes, you do need heavy elements in order to form the ices that allow condensation into solid material. And so that's um, likely to occur only in a galaxy that is uh, long, old enough to um, have had gone through cycles of star formation and death. Um, meaning hundreds of millions of years. So I would say any ensemble of stars that's a billion years old or older is likely to 
uh, be available for the formation of stars, uh, sorry, planets around stars. All right, I'm gonna close off questions at this point because we're getting pretty late here. We could do this for a long time. It hurts me to do this, but uh, Professor Williams, thank you so much for being with us. I really appreciate it. I'm sure the members are uh, fl frankly flabbergasted. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, it was my, my, my pleasure. Um, wish you uh, folks all the best and for sure, um, contact people in the department there and get a few of them to uh, um, actually participate in uh, the activities of the club in some way. You know, it, it's always great to have a, a mentor, a professional, particularly with all of the resources available there in Peyton Hall. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Williams. You. Fabulous. This, this is, and tell this, them this I told you that. <laughs> they have a responsibility. <laughs> We'll use that. Thank you so much for giving us leverage there. And that was a fabulous talk. We love it. So best of luck I to you and the whole team. Best of luck yeah, to the whole well, team. Well, I wish, uh, I wish the association every success. Cheerio. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.